and welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. I'm here to talk about getting rid of burnout, increasing job satisfaction, and feeling like an expert in what you do. One thing that created a lot of burnout and angst for me was trying to get continued medical education right at the last minute. So why not join the CME membership and do CME while listening to this podcast? Go to psychiatrypodcast.com, sign up, sign in, take the test, and the certification is emailed to you in seconds. Before we start the show, we'd like to announce conflicts of interest. Neither Dr. Pewter nor Dr. Harmon have any conflicts of interest to announce. So let's begin the show. All right, welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today with Dr. Herbert Harmon. He is a psychiatrist who works for Vituity as the practice line director for acute psychiatry. It is a national partnership of physicians that offers acute care services, including the specialty of psychiatry. He went to medical school at the University of Virginia and residency at Western Psychiatric Clinic in Pittsburgh. He was commissioned by the Air Force and deployed through the Army in Afghanistan. And we will be talking today about moral injury, which is perpetuating, failing to prevent, bearing witness to, or learning about acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. It is similar to PTSD, but different. We'll be talking about in the context of the military, but also this extends to various fields where you're on the front line, including probably psychiatry, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll also talk about identity and how identity and narrative and the stories that we tell ourselves kind of intertwine into moral injury and how it's important to have a narrative that we can improve and get better and progress. And we'll talk about that as well. So Dr. Harmon, welcome. Yeah, thanks so much. So it's he he um, he goes into hospitals, finds contracts for groups of physicians. That's part of his part of his job. He's also a psychiatrist. Also worked in the military, right, overseas, or where were you when you and how many years did you spend there? Correct. So I had an active duty uh, commission. Actually, still do uh, with the United States Air Force. I was on active duty. Uh, for four years, the entire time uh, stationed at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey and had one deployment. I was called what's uh, ILO task in lieu of the army had churned through all of their psychiatrists and they started borrowing folks. So I got attached to the 82nd Airborne and went down to Fort Hood in Texas and did all my combat skills training and then uh, went with the uh, infantry to Afghanistan for the better part of a year gone from home for about eight and a half months total actually so that's brutal um, yeah it was interesting i i learned a lot so i guess that's why we're talking <laughs> yeah so we were we were having a conversation a couple weeks ago and i was like i really got to bring you onto the podcast and have this conversation like kind of out loud because i feel like it would be helpful we're going to be talking about moral injury which i feel like as a provider, once you really understand what moral injury is, you're going to, and it's different than PTSD. It overlaps a little bit, but it's different. Once you really understand what moral injury is, I think you're going to better understand how to talk to vets, how to talk to people who have been, for example, in the police, maybe even on the front lines of like CPS. So I think understanding the concept of moral injury will allow you to know how to ask the right questions, um, listen more empathically, and help these people uh, overcome, right? And so we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about identity, you know, res respecting, um, you know, the work that was done in the military that these vets did. So Dr. Hartman can tell me more about what that means. And maybe when you know that you probably shouldn't be working at the VA or when you shouldn't be working with this population. And then um, we'll talk about how you really want to get people better. And I, I think we really resonate together because I, I run this program and we always see these people that get stuck in this idea of illness and I am illness and I am disabled and I am chronically this way. And the narrative of that is in and of itself toxic. It has secondary gains. There's reasons why they want that, but it's toxic to the person, like psychologically, to believe that does something to them that then 
doesn't allow them to thrive, you know? So yeah, we're at, shall we start with moral injury and, and talk about what that is? Sure. Uh, you know, it's um, interesting to try and uh, describe what moral injury is, because as we've learned from reviewing some of the literature, it's sort of all over the map. And most of the publications that seem really well-written have a little section somewhere that says, yeah, we're, we're still trying to de- get a consensus or, you know, um, define this. But in, in short, it is how a lot of folks in clinical care and in, cl- in research are describing a reaction to events that may or may not be understood as traumatic events in which an individual's identity and sense of justice or sense of purpose is shattered by the event. And it's usually an event where something is very personal, very visceral. Uh, So the easy to describe circumstance for a moral injury would be a uh, deployment where there's a commanding officer who does something unethical or immoral and the people under that person uh, have to then do something that they feel is unethical or moral and they follow through with that thing, whether it's uh, hurting someone or violating some sort of ethical code or violating uh, an, a religious identity that or spiritual identity that they have and then emerging from that and having a set of symptoms that can overlap with PTSD, but look very different when you're paying attention. And what I mean by that is there's not so much the startle response or the dissociative episodes or the re-experiencing. It's more self-loathing, depression, isolation, avoidance. And a lot of it can be found in a narrative that a person has about what they're experiencing as they're describing, I don't know who I am anymore. And I have no, a lot of lack of motivation for, you know, self-care and, and for care of others feeling like, you know, I don't, I, I'm not worthy of caring for my kids or my wife anymore. You know, that, so again, overlapping with depression, not necessarily meeting criteria for major depressive disorder though. Um, so I think that's part of what makes it so hard. It doesn't, it doesn't fit nicely in any of our boxes. Yep. So there's this, um, potentially morally injurious event and you mentioned one type there's it's in that review you gave me, there's two types. There's the, um, betrayal based event, which is like betrayal by a leader, or a trusted authority, bringing you into something, making you guys do something, maybe doing something to you. There's that. And then there's the perpetuation based event, which is what you're like perpetuating or witnessing actions that violates one, one's core beliefs. So you're violating your own values or rejecting previously held religious beliefs. And so you have this event. So it's different than PTSD, which is like a near death experience, right? And there could be also mixed in, of course, in war near death experiences. But this, this seems to me like when I sat with vets for a long time and you're trying to get to like, what's really going on, this is the story that they don't tell you. Mm -hmm. Right. This is, they tell you, they tell you a, like a narrative that they've told a bunch of people often. Um, and it's like when they're telling it to you, there's not a lot of affect on their face. They're not experiencing dissociation or anger or sadness. But then when you get to this event, it's like they can't even go there. They can't even talk about it. As, yeah, no, a, a, absolutely. And the, the, the perpetuation that you're, you're talking about most commonly and the, the easiest to visualize, understand, and describe is just the act of killing someone. And so for many veterans you know, who have grown up in the United States, uh, very, you know, I'll just use the word typical. I don't like that word, but <laughs> I'm, I'm failing to find a better word in this moment, but typical experience, you know, going to elementary school and you've got one or two parents who care about you and neighbors and you play sports and you learn about democracy and nationalism and whatever. And then you find yourself at close range, killing another human being um, and coming home wondering, was that necessary? And is this who I am? And and the worst case scenario for folks uh, being fully enmeshed in the experience to the point where it's an enjoyable experience to be in that warrior moment. Um, And then having to recognize that this is, you know, part of who I am. 
And I, I have to confront that now. I now know that it's possible for me to enjoy killing people. And that is not uncommon, right? So if you're a warrior and you're in war, I mean, we've all seen, even if you've never been deployed to a wartime environment, if you've ever watched a movie like Private Ryan, you can understand, um, you know, if you've got your group of guys and you're fighting another group and you survive and you save your buddies, that's exhilarating probably. That's a, that doesn't mean you're a bad person through the lens of a civilian. Um, but if it's you, um, that's a very different experience because it's you. And, um, and you know, what do you now think about yourself and how do you, how, how, how do you reconcile that? So I first really had began to appreciate what we're talking about when I was um, not while I was deployed, but instead while I was stateside, both before and after my deployment, uh, we were stationed near Philadelphia and large recruiting centers in Philly. And this was, I was active from 05 to 09. So if you recall um, in the intensity of fighting, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty high. And we had already experienced, you know, many thousands of folks uh, redeployed. So the offensive in 2003 in Iraq was was long over, but the um, after effects were there. So uh, for Marines, after they serve a number of you know combat deployments, they usually get sent to recruit. And so I had these 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 men who had multiple deployments and had killed a lot of people who were now going into high schools and recruiting young men and then sitting down with their families and explaining why this was the best option. And they were a mess. They, and, and um, that all came out. And there was a strength that I had from after deploying that al allowed me to connect with them. And the strength is not inherent to me. It was, it was just simply the fact that I'd been there. So they could, to, they they gave themselves permission to talk about these things with me, especially when I came home. You know, beforehand they would talk to me a little bit, but once I got back, it was a completely different experience, and I got the full story, or at least what I perceived to be the full story. And um, you know, PTSD was there, but and and de but it was mostly a combination of depression and identity, which we're now you know as we're talking about you know defining as moral injury. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, you know, like just to reiterate in PTSD, you'll get the startle reflex, the flashbacks, the nightmares, the insomnia, but in the moral injury, what they found is that there is an increased risk of mental disorder, suicidal ideation, attempts, guilt, shame, especially if there was perpetration, anger, especially if there was betrayal, there's anhedonia, you feel socially alienated. Like you're saying, like you don't feel like someone who's a civilian would ever really understand what you're going through. You'll feel some resentment maybe due to feeling misunderstood by civilians, which increases suicidal risk as well. There's depression, there's in, you know self-deprecation. You feel social isolation maybe, maybe act out a little bit, substance use, destructive behavior, aggression towards others. There's mixed studies on, on that piece in particular. And then there's also like religious struggles. You know, I feel abandoned by God. I'm doubting my beliefs. I'm questioning my purpose. I'm perceiving one's actions. You know, I'm perceiving my own actions as a violation of my religious spiritual ethic. I, I am unforgivable. So you're back from deployment. You're meeting with these people. You're trying to help them through their own moral injuries that they've experienced. Yeah, that seems very gripping to me. Tell me, are any stories coming to your mind on how you, in particular, or what that was like? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can I can think of uh, like two or three cases I you know probably remember forever. You know, it was, uh, it was an officer who had uh, led uh, a group you know, moving in in 2003 and um, one of the Iraqi fighters that end up, you know, taken by our U.S. forces and interviewed and, you know, just make sure that, you know, like, hey, uh, you know, this is not someone who's 
intending to function as an insurgent. And uh, I got to know most of these guys pretty pretty quickly and realized, you know, okay, well, we're just two humans representing different leaders and organizations. And uh, identified the folks who said, yeah, you know, we want to build a better country. We want to work with you. And then befriended them, right? And then set up, you know, help help set up the uh, Iraqi military. And then short order, people coming in from other countries, establishing an insurgency. The, uh, you know, our U.S. officers had to fight alongside these guys that they had just months before been, you know, in, on opposing forces. And then they became like battle buddies. So U.S. military and Iraqi military becoming close friends, getting to know each other, learning about each other's families and kids. And then the U.S. officer says, I'm going to go left, you go right. And the guy goes right and he, he gets killed. Um, and there was something about that dynamic for this one officer that I have in mind that just was life shattering for him. He had somehow reconciled everything that had happened with the initial push uh, in his own mind to allow him to recover and move forward. But then he formed an alliance. Basically, I think it was, we talk in the literature about making amends, how making amends can really help people. There's a whole process for that in certain kinds of psychotherapy. And then when um, that was shattered by what he probably, what he said felt like was a betrayal, you know, of him, you know, he betrayed this, this person that he had brought into the fold. How did he betray him or what was the... Um... Well, by put, you know, by sending him into battle, <laughs> um, you know, by making operational decisions that ultimately led to his death. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they were still fighting on the same side, but, you know, as in, you're making decisions and this right. is your person. Right. You know, this is your, this is your, you feel responsible. You feel morally obligated to keep this person as safe as possible. And then something bad happens. Right. Right. Yeah, that kind of and thing. then the, the the other cases I can think of, and one one in particular uh, was a Marine who just, uh, from what I could gather, just a, a really um, emotional, a very sweet human being, stateside. You know, growing up, felt a sense of honor, duty. You know, very patriotic, and had just killed a number of people at very close range. Was apparently a very good, you know, fighter. And um, really believed in what he was doing, and over time, it's just as the war drug on, just became less and less enchanted with the idea that he was making a difference or anything that he did made a difference. And all that he was left with was, you know, the U.S. government's very good at helping me kill people, um, and that's what I do, and that's who I am, and mm. um, that's never been who I wanted to be or what I'm about. And when I would chat with them before or after our, you know, individual sessions, you know, just kind of helping people feel comfortable coming into the room. How's your week? You know, um, you could tell, you could get experience all the social reciprocity, you know, all the, all the um, little things that he would say and get some sense for what, what he was like if you were his neighbor and how he came across to me socially was a complete opposite of the narrative for what he was and who, what he had to do to survive on deployments. And it kind of, he was like empty inside, you know, other than carrying this tremendous weight try, as he was trying to figure out, okay, well, who am I now? How do I understand who I am now? And, and what does that mean about my capacity to be a loving spouse and a parent and a, and a, and a person who cares about his society, you know, society and, being a U.S. citizen and everything, everything was, everything else was a mess. The one thing he knew was that he was really good at, you know, fighting. And so um, he had to try to figure out what to do with that. Yeah. So there's that kind of like identity, narr like my narrative of myself has shifted and it's kind of like dis the disenchantment. I see that with, um, psychiatrists as well sometimes they or therapists it's like they just get it's like when we get tired when we get burned out i, I don't know it's probably not a good parallel but uh i don't know i think i, I think it is okay i think it is it's like um, okay like it, it moves from like i feel like the humanitarian aspect of the work that we do is really meaningful right we're helping people 
but yeah, we can get disenfranchised and kind of get where we can be like, okay, it's just a job. It's just money coming in. It's just to provide it kind of, is that what you're thinking? Well, I, I think we work in, you know, everyone says, Oh, we'll fix the U S you know, healthcare system. I laugh and say, um, if there was a system, we could fix it. Right. And so we're sort of bouncing around between healthcare systems, insurance companies, global economies, you know, uh, state governments, federal government regulations, and trying to do the best we can. And so, for instance, when you said that, the first thing that came to mind for me was just what it feels like to stand in an emergency room and see people flooding in desperate for anything, help, right? And the emergency room, is, it's very defined. There's things that the ER can and can't do. And most of your needs can't be met in an ER. You know, the emergency need can be met. And so, um, you, you talk in your podcast um, often about the value of the IOP type services that yep. you've been able to deliver in your career. And I'm a huge fan of them because I think there's, they're so helpful and there needs to be way more of it. And also true for most people on, say, for instance, Medicaid, that's not a possibility, right? So when I see people in the emergency room and they don't have an emergency medical condition that requires emergency intervention, but they would definitely benefit from an IOP or PHP. Yeah. Um, I'm getting paid to say, hey, what you need is this thing. And I know this thing doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> it's really so I'm right. And so I'm trying to say, okay, well, let's patch together what else could look like that. And you know, deep down, like you can't really replicate it without, without the thing. <laughs> and you're facilitating a discharge. You're there to facilitate a discharge and you're getting paid for it. And you kind of still have to go home and look at yourself in the mirror and go, wow, like, how did I end up here? And it's not, you know, it's not like things would be better if I wasn't there. And it's not like things would be better if I made a different decision, right? You know, because I can't justify admitting people who don't meet criteria. They could get assaulted or diseased on the inpatient unit. There's no, you know, virtue. There's no um, heroism in admitting someone who doesn't need to be there, nor is there heroism in, you know, staying home and saying, well, that's somebody else's problem to, to manage. But we're left... I think often churning in systems where we came into medicine hoping that we were going to do something very specific and we're always going to, you know, deliver something great. Um, and when you have a seer, when it when it's pretty normal to go into a shift and and see all this suffering and and uh, feel sometimes like you you're you're just kind of a, a cog, as they say, you know, in the wheel. I think you can start to experience things like that. Yeah. I think, um, I think that's why I enjoy doing therapy, individual therapy, although it's, you know, as a psychiatrist, it probably would be more, you know, economical to just do more med management and have someone else do the therapy. But I, th I love being a part of the process, you know, of the therapy itself. Okay. So we're getting back to this, this, this person that you, that I want out with this, the story of this, this officer who sent in the Iraqi, how did you help him? Or do you feel like you were able to help him? Or how did no, the group I, help him? Yeah. So he had a number of resources, not least of important was a case manager who would check in on him frequently and make sure that any kind of appointments he had were, you know, reminding him, you have an appointment with your therapist tomorrow at two, you know, you have an appointment for your lower back pain next Wednesday. Or, and so he was on medication for depression. I don't remember. It's too far gone to remember what or any of the specifics probably don't really matter here. Uh, but I was there to help make sure that anything that, um, any medication he was going to be on actually made sense. Um, yep. I think folks with moral injury, uh, it's easy. If they're drifting in the community, they're going to come into you possibly on a bunch of benzos, opiates, and stimulants. So for, for folks who are listening, uh, I mean to say benzodiazepines, which are sedatives, which can be abused. And although they might facilitate a little bit of sleep, actually disrupt deep sleep wave architecture. Um, you know, um, opiates, opioids, things like oxycodone, for chronic pain, uh, commonly for acute pain or cancer, but as if you're uh, listening to popular press, 
um, or you work in medicine, you know there's a, there was an there was an epidemic of overprescribed opiates at the time. That was that was still going on, you know, way worse than it is now. And and stimulants, uh, which you know, if you've been through trauma, you're you're not concentrating, you, or at least you appear as if you're not concentrating. To most observers, you can easily find yourself, you know, talk talk somebody into believing that you have adult onset attention deficit or something like that. So. Um, I think it's a pretty common experience for psychiatrists to have folks land in their office on some combination of these three drugs. So I think a lot of what I did was for these guys to make sure like either they're not on these drugs or if they are on them, I'm helping them get off and we'll go ahead and try SSRIs or mood stabilizers, um, SSRIs, higher doses, mood stabilizers, average doses, anything that is going to make sense for treating PTSD and depression and not put them at risk for getting worse instead of better. And also just really validating their experiences. The, the uh, gentleman who, um, the officer who was in Iraq that I was talking about, I actually had to help him get hospitalized. He came into my office and said, I found him in the hospital today, I'll be dead tonight. And um, I couldn't get his commanding officer to take him. Um, I couldn't get the ambulance to take him either. Everyone was afraid. It was it was a really intense moment, and I actually, I actually said, "All right, for this moment, we're just, uh, you know, we're in uniform together, and I'm your battle buddy." And I, I personally drove him to the hospital and wow. called the attending, who said, "Meet me outside the elevator." We rode the elevator up to the unit, and he, wow. the attending, opened the door, and I walked him on the unit. Um, it was the only way I could do it because we were on base, and um, it it was the only time in my life I've done something like that and I don't regret it and I don't advise it being a practice. Right. Yeah. I think sometimes we, we do what's in the best interest of the patient. You know, at the end of the day, I had this one person reach out to me on Instagram and they were like, I think my patient has akesthesia. And this was like, you know, a therapist who's listened to the akesthesia episode. And uh, so their patients like pacing around restless on high doses of antipsychotics. And uh, I'm like, well, I think you should call the attending. And there was all this fear around calling the attending, you know, cause that's not normal protocol. Normal protocols going to my boss, but my boss doesn't even doesn't really know what akesthesia is. I said, sometimes you got to do what's in the best interest of the patient. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, like we can't get too far away from doing what's in the best interest of the patient. And sometimes you have to, you know, change the rules a little bit. It's not the normal thing for you to probably drive this person to the unit. You drove them to the unit. Is that right? Yeah, literally, yeah. it was it was the only way. I spent like an hour trying to convince people, and he was clear with me. This guy knew weapons yeah. very well. Um, yeah, yeah, it's one of those things. Where <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had this one. I had this one um, ex cop who was a uh, undercover for decades, and so he he didn't look like a cop. He looked like a he looked like a a thug, and no one would see this guy without security. And I, um, I think the first couple of times I had security outside my door, you know, but then I eventually saw him alone, but it just, some people are really scary. They look, they, they just look scary. And I think that's part of working with this population is to realize like, just because they've been violent in war doesn't mean they're going to be violent in your office, you know, unless they have a history of becoming unhinged with people who are civilians and normal people or providers you know, if they have a history of violence in war, they're probably not any more at risk of being violent in your office than a normal person, I would assume. No, I I had never. Um, I had the, yeah, I had the luxury of personal experience that kind of helped me understand what you were just saying. And I wasn't at all worried about him hurting me. I was 100% worried about what would happen uh, if he left. Because uh, I... I I'm, I'm confident something bad would have happened. I don't, of course, can't actually forecast, but, uh, yep. but yeah, these are folks who, you know, identity, like we're saying, you know, identity matters. And, you know, occasionally it's like, you know, my identity, I, yes, I'm a psychiatrist. Yes. I'm a healthcare professional, but you know, if you're also a veteran, if you're also active duty at the time, you have all these different things that you represent to the person that you're caring for. And, Sometimes one of those identities steps forward more than the other. 
And uh, I think if you can respect that and, and observe it and, and be transparent about it, you can use it to help people. I just have to be careful. Yeah. Okay. I have a story for you and I've never told my audience this story. This is what, this is one of the reasons why I went into psychiatry. So I'm a third year medical student. I'm going to change a couple of the facts I always do to kind of like hide the patient's identity. You want to be able to trace these stories back um, to any particular person. So I don't feel like I'm violating HIPAA or, you know, but it was this older guy who came in to the, to the ER and I'm seeing him. I was on internal medicine. He had like new onset diabetes or something like that. But I get talking to him and I just, I had this weird feeling like I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a deeper conversation with this guy. You know, things were slow. I didn't have like six patients to go to after. So he was a, he was a Vietnam vet and he was telling me he hadn't slept well since Vietnam, which is like 40 years or so. And so I asked him like, questions about it. And he was pretty guarded. And I said, you know, I, I think it's really hard to tell these stories. I think it's hard to, to, you know, tell the truth of what happened, which may be troubling you. And so he told me two stories that were moral injury stories. The first one, he was in a tunnel and, um, there was someone up ahead who was an enemy combatant and he shot him. And then when he crawled to the guy, he realized um, it was a like a 10-year-old. And that was like dev- something that would repeatedly come out as like guilt, shame, violation of, you know, his moral code. He was Catholic. And this this the second thing was um he was he was hunkered down with two of his buddies. They were receiving heavy fire. And he injected his buddy with morphine and the guy, his buddy was shot really, really bad. And his buddy was still in pain and he knew if he injected his buddy with more morphine, he might kill his buddy. And so when he did, he blamed himself for the death of his, his buddy and blamed himself for not like going in front of the line and, you know, his buddy being there. And so he had survivor guilt. And so, he told me he had never told anyone this story before. And I think, um, I, th- I think that was the honest truth. I, he was pretty guarded about it initially. And um, he was Catholic. And so he wanted to utilize his spiritual resources. He ended up praying and I was there with him during that. And um, so I checked on him every night after that, every day for the next like five days, you know, he's in the hospital. And every, every time I would walk into the room, he would just have this big smile on it. And he'd say, I slept through the night. And I almost like didn't believe it, you know, that like one event could change. It's like sleep, right? And um, so I, I, I wrote down his MRN and called him up about two months later just to check in on him. And he said, yeah, he's sleeping great. He had other problems, you know, going on, <laughs> like most people do, you know. Right. Oh, I'm I'm having some conflict with my girl girlfriend, you know, or but I'm sleeping so much better, and I don't think about those things ever, anymore, you know. And I, I've started he, he started reengaging his Catholic background. So when I was reading this paper, I was thinking, like, wow, that guy. It wasn't normal PTSD. It was it was definitely a moral injury, and just listening in the right way and you helping him utilize his own sources of strength that he already had, that he wasn't utilizing uh, for him, for him. I think it was like tapping into this idea of forgiveness that he could be forgiven for this or that, you know, he deeply didn't want this to happen hmm. and that he could be forgiven. Uh, right. I think that was helpful for him. Right. That a, a human being could hear this story and not reject him. Um, that was probably and, that was probably part of it, yeah. The powerful part is like I could, I st- I stood with him with like you know, kind of like no no judgment that, that this stuff happened, and some compassion for him and the, the amount of suffering, and knowing that he wouldn't have wanted to kill, but that was like what happened, and it violated his his moral code. I think he would have, 
I think he wanted to, you know, do what was right. And it just was a huge violation of what he felt like was right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is a, a common, you know, experience, I think for folks working with veterans and, you know, and, and as you were saying before, it's, it's not, it's not confined to military. It's, you know, anybody on the front lines of emergency medical services or law enforcement, um, healthcare providers, just, I, I'm sure, of course, I'm, I, educators, there's, yeah. the, the list was long in, in some of these research where they found, you know, different categories of people where you can suspect some percentage of them. Are. CPS was a big one. I, I had a, another IOP patient I worked very closely with, did some therapy with as well, who felt like she would uncover abusive situations that kids were going through and report it but then they wouldn't do anything about it. It would like get stuck. The upper levels would, would stop it. Mm -hmm. And, um, it wasn't, that was like a moral injury for her. Really, really troubling because she, she had a history of abuse. She was going into this field to help kids and she was having a hard time helping kids get out of the situations that they were in. Just these dire situations sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it could be, you you can imagine as you're as you're listening to this, I'm sure your patient stories are coming to your mind. I'm sure your own stories maybe are coming to your mind. Places where it's like you were just you felt stuck. How do I make this better? You know, mm -hmm. how do I how do I make this system better? That's not ideal. Right. Yeah. A lot of what you're describing too. It's reminding me why I I, I say all the time. You know, I don't do med management. Nobody does med management because <laughs> I don't like that term because it implies that the patient is the pill. Um, it implies that um, we're not mm. reducing suffering. We're facilitating some sort of transaction because for these kinds of cases, if you don't have enough time to sit in silence and really listen, uh, they're going to look on the surface, like other things that could possibly cut, you could come where you could come to the conclusion that, oh, an SSRI is what's indicated here, which is not to say that none of these cases we're describing, you know, include patients that would benefit from SSRIs, but to lose the context, you could possibly lose the everything and uh, unknowingly have an interaction with somebody where they feel invalidated when you completely miss the point which is not to say again, not to say that, you know, medicine is bad or wrong or whatever. It's just when you're talking about a cardiologist, nobody says, you know, Oh, I have a cardiologist. And then I have a med management cardiologist, you know, you have a cardiologist, they treat all things related to the heart. And as that relates to the rest of your body, you have psychiatrists, you know, we should be having enough time with individuals to make sure that that context is appreciated and understood. And that's yep. really hard when the patient has a therapist um, that you maybe don't know well or don't get a chance to really communicate with often unless you're doing the therapy yourself or you're simply having longer sessions such that it's sort of like at the very least supportive psychotherapy and motivational interviewing to get the information you need to really help this person and establish that trust and rapport, even if they're getting CBT with you know somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, so there were there were two other things you wanted to kind of hit on, and I think they kind of tie into what we're talking about. One is identity is re respected, right? So you talked about how if you're t talk about how the the provider can't let their bias slip in, or if they have too much bias, maybe it's not the right person to help. Sure. Talk about that a little bit. Sure, I you know I think just like if you know. If you're somebody who works, for instance, with uh, victims of sexual assault and your go-to is to wonder, you know, what that person did <laughs> to, uh, you know, bring on you know, being sexually assaulted or what sort of irresponsible behavior they were engaged with that maybe set them up for this, you probably shouldn't be working with victims of sexual assault. And in a similar way, if you're working with veterans, you're working with active duty service members and your bias is to assume but well, you never should have enlisted, you know, 
you never should have gotten a commission. Don't you understand the military industrial complexes, blah, blah, blah. Now, no judgment for people who want to confront <laughs> governments or be critical of, of uh, warfare, because I certainly am critical of governments and, and warfare. But if you're going, if if your way of approaching the world is such that that's part of your identity, that's uh, and you're not able to step back and be curious and compassionate, um, both across, you know, the full spectrum of understanding what what may have occurred, and and very specifically for this individual, then you probably should look for someone else to help take care of them, because that's going to seep through, you know, if if because uh, I I have met with therapists who have said like. Well, yeah, you know, I'm not, I don't really like working with the veteran population. They signed, they knew what they were getting when they signed up. And that's, awful. that's an yeah. awful thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. I almost want to like, yeah. Ugh. Right. Well, I mean, like, yeah, probably refer that to a colleague who has some compassion or just don't work for the VA or, you know, yeah. So it's like you have to, because what you said is, it's important for them to understand, like, to some degree, what they were doing was meaningful. And it has to, I think that's why World War One and Two is like a little bit easier than Vietnam and some of the other more ambiguous wars. It seemed very sort of black and white, right? The, you know, Nazis are bad and they continue to be bad. Anyone who's bad is called labeled a Nazi, right? So it was very clear, like you were a hero. And I think some in some more of these ambiguous wars, it's like it's a little bit harder to have that narrative be so strong yes yeah and and we've uh you know we now have a very much a, a professional military right so it's not the situation you know like you're mentioning in the so-called great war and you know u.s sat back and waited until it was <laughs> things were so bad there was no choice or at least that was a person that's the that's in retrospect that's i think what most of us have come to, you know, that's, that's, that's the narrative that gets sold to us, whatever, you know, uh, whatever, however you interpret that and things fast forward, uh, the last 70 years have been more about prevention police force, you know, almost being a, you know, so-called world police at times is how some people will describe what NATO countries or the United States, you know, things, efforts led by the United States have been like where it is much more gray it's much more ambiguous um, and confusing. And um, you're expected to come home, you know? So I think, you know, folks who were marching across Europe during World War II, they're like, we're either gonna win or we're gonna die. Hmm. Um, and those are the two, you know, the, those are the two options. Whereas in today's wars, it's like, well, we're gonna win or we're gonna die, or it's gonna get really gray and muddy and then most of us are gonna come home. And most of them do come home, uh, but they're coming home with these problems. And, you know, they're coming home with head injuries, they're coming home with PTSD, and they're coming home with, with moral injury specifically, which is poorly defined. And we're, we're all still struggling to figure out what that means. <laughs> what does that mean for society? What is, what is, and what does it mean when a, when a person lands in your office with this thing that doesn't fit nicely in DSM-5 and there's not a pill for it? And the psychotherapies that are being developed or, and, and deployed to help treat it are in very, very early stages of, of yeah. being researched and, and appreciated. I think, I think most therapy is going to work for most people. I think if, if the practitioner understands a little bit about moral injury, they'll probably be a more effective provider because they'll know the right questions to ask or why this might be difficult. Okay, there's one other thing you wanted to hit which was that you think it's important for people to believe that they're going to get better and that they respond to that sort of thing. And I've, I found this as well with patients. There's, there's, you know, since I run a, a program for people with medical problems and psychiatric problems, they come in often with this thought that this medical problem is going to keep me disabled for the rest of my life. And it's hard for them to to break free of that sort of narrative. And they've, there's secondary gains that are known and unknown for that. You know, the family sometimes has secondary gains. So it's, yeah. And tell me your thoughts on this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think, um, 
you know, the, I think the, the, the financial and political systems we have that are intended to support people who are suffering sometimes backfire for the patient uh, when, when a person's identity is shattered and it gets re- reformed as a sick individual and they find themselves thinking like, oh, well, you know, I'm getting compensated for being sick. This is, this is now who I am. It's an easy identity to construct. And it does, at least in the short term, help people get by it, it gives them something to bond with others around. It gives them um, something to talk about. Um, and then there's financial reward. And so it, that cutting through all that can be really challenging. And I think when you're when we're dealing with, with veterans who have symptoms of PTSD and or moral injury, it's really important to help them understand like that you as the therapist are leaning in with, with hope and optimism. That's your lens. My lens is, you know, I don't care who pays you what, you know, <laughs> and I yep. told you that's this. I don't care if the U.S. government gives you $100,000 a year for the rest of your life for whatever reason, for just simply because you're a veteran, if they want to, or because you used to have PTSD. But I'm telling you, you can recover. And my job is I'm not going to rest until I think that we've done everything we can to make your life as fulfilling as possible. And you can see how horribly the system has treated people because there's a lot of folks who never come back <laughs> when, you, when you say that. Um, uh, and the ones that do are sometimes come back like, wow, you know, no one's really, no one's really said that to me before. And I just, I have a second wind, you know, and I want to hear more about what we can do because you gave me a three few pointers. You know, I already started going to the gym you know, I already made that phone call and I've reached out and I've got a therapy, a, you know, a first intake psychotherapy appointment in two weeks. And, you know, and, and um, you just wonder how do we reach those folks who that for whom that's off-putting and there has to be a systemic approach because it's not something, something that an individual provider can do because they have to actually be in your office. Right. So, so there's, there's powerful secondary gains. So it's great that we have the ability to, to, to have some of those as well. You know, it's great that we have a safety net for people who are really struggling. PTSD on some of these like psychiatric things, it's like if in their mind they believe there is no exit, they're never going to get better. They're not going to be able to rejoin society. You know, it's like, it's like there's something that happens inside of their mind where they, then they just don't move forward. You know, it's like that kind of like, learned helplessness type of thing that happens. It's like, okay, there's no reason to work hard on this, to overcome this. It's, I, I, there's this, this is an insurmountable burden. I've seen it as well with people in like lawsuits Mm -hmm. and for them to win this lawsuit, they have to be ill. And so they've been coached probably by a lawyer to report things to me or to be ill or somehow unconsciously that's in their mind. Right. It's it's hard to discern if it's like malingering. Malingering is when they're directly lying or if they're just believing this enough because they know they need this for their family to survive. You know, they need this huge lawsuit, whatever it is. Interestingly, one one service member, not a certain, not like military, but outside of the military, he was seeing me pretty faithfully for about two years. I, and then I was part of a deposition and then he never saw me again. <laughs> he, he, got, he got, he got what he needed. Um, and he moved on. And in retrospect, I probably helped his court case, but I think also I, um, you know, I wasn't like now, now I can look back and see how maybe he was looking for me to have these symptoms in his chart you know, and it's unfortunate, but, you know, so people have secondary gains and it's like, how do we help them overcome that? It's really one of the harder things that we have to face because often they're entrenched in their secondary gains in their family as well. Like the family is benefiting. The the family is trying to keep them in this sick role and um, shame them back into sickness almost. Right. 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 Yeah. And, and almost all the things that go into that, 
put people at increased risk for adverse events, right? So uh, these are folks who are usually physically inactive. They're usually socially inactive. They usually have some form of addiction, nicotine, alcohol, and uh, they're just, and, and they're, they're not deeply socially connected. So if something happens, you know, where they need to lean in and ask, you know, ask people to lean in and receive support. There's not too many folks there um, for them. And so it's not, it's not just, you know, ethically, legally ambiguous. Like these are folks who are suffering in ways that you can tell as a, as a physician when you get to know the whole story, um, but they're not coming in saying that stuff, you know, they're saying, oh, I have, I have nightmares. Um, I have depression and it's always going to be here. And I need to see you every six months so I can send a copy of this evaluation to the VA so they can send it to my case manager. Those are the you know things that people say. And that's your opportunity to say, oh, okay. <laughs> what's what's going so what's going on in your life and wh- what what are you doing to treat these symptoms and how can I how can I help? And so it's extremely challenging to help the folks who made it clear that they, they don't want that. And I, I know there's a lot of people who they, I think the natural impulse is to you know be upset about that. But I think we need to be very compassionate for the fact that these are individuals who have been molded into this by others. And we need to be deeply curious about the origin of the suffering that would give themselves permission to let that happen and perpetuate it. And then compassionate for ourselves when we have that that feeling emerge, like, wow, you know, I, I feel contempt. Where's that coming from? What's what is going on in my own life? That's helping. That's causing me to feel this this contempt because this is just a human being across from me that's suffering, and I'm a I'm here to deliver, you know, something that's going to make them better. And the, you know that sense of entitlement that I'm feeling right now is is doing nothing to help me help them. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I think I think we have to look at ourselves and do our own work so that we can stay compassionate, definitely through. And, and consistently, you know, both, both a, a voice of like hope for them, but also empathic to the distress of overcoming and launching and venturing out and, you know, changing the equilibrium. And this is where I think, I, I think it's so important to look for congruent affect. You know, if someone is telling you the, the symptoms and there's like the, the con- the congruency of the affect, you know, the internal and external don't match, right? So the internal experience of their affect is like, they look pretty cheerful, they look pretty happy, but then they desc- they're they describing something that's very different. It's like, we wanna look for what's congruent and I wanna spend my time in therapy there. And sometimes it's really hard to get there. So sometimes I use writing or even artwork to try to get someone into a congruent space. It's like, what is talking congruent? Is writing congruent? Is art congruent? Which is the most congruent? And then let's bridge from there to the other ones that are congruent. You know, if if the, the trauma that they're reporting is not congruent, what is the congruent distress that they do have? Or maybe they feel um, they're, they're congruently happy for some success so we can be enthusiastic and and connect with them with their successes. And I think it's much more important to do that than to look for something that isn't there, some sadness or some emotion that isn't there and connect with them only in negative emotion. So we need to connect both with the positive and the congruent negative emotion. And I think that's the daily work of the therapy that (laughs) then moves the person forward. Right, right. Everything is, there are things other than lingering in PTSD somewhere in between is like most of humanity. (laughs) Right. Oh, the other thing I was thinking about is like people with like chronic back pain, like sometimes exercise actually makes it better. Mm -hmm. Fibromyalgia exercise actually helps it moderation, moderate exercise, not too hard. And, um, so even that kind of stuff, it's like, if you're stronger, you're going to be less likely to have pain. I've had a number of friends who have chronic back pain, real have had you know bulging discs or real issues and then they start squatting deadlifting their pain actually decreases 
you know, thoughtfully doing it right with the correct technique and everything and a coach. So, so even like, like sometimes even the physical stuff, it's like, can be overcome. So I, 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 it's like when someone comes in and they're on the amphetamines, the opiates, the benzos, it's like, how do I motivate this person to get off those things and to, and, and often marijuana as well, or some other intoxicating substances and then get on this path to like recovery so that they can thrive. It's tough. That's, that's, it's really tough, especially if that's not what they want for themselves. <laughs> right. And it, or at least superficially want for themselves. I think deeply they want that on a, the deepest level. They want that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, you know, to bring us back, you know, a little bit of, with, yep. with moral injury that it's, you're, you're really trying to understand what is this person's, what was their identity before these events or this singular event? And what is it now? What does that mean? And how does all of that correlate with the things we know make a person healthy um, and allow them to progress with purpose and meaning? And I think, you know, I, I think um, it's becomes really important to, to spend enough time with our patients to figure out how to create space so that they can actually divulge what those things are. Um, you know, it's super easy to get a PHQ-9 and ask all the questions to figure out if someone has major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, um, those things we can accomplish pretty quickly, pretty in a, in a, it's fairly simple. But to create a relationship and, 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 and a space, the emotional space for a person to divulge to you. This is what gives my life purpose and meaning. Um, and maybe right now, the things that are giving their life purpose and meaning, they know are counter to who they were before. And there's an incongruence and they need to reconcile that. And they are desperate for someone to give them permission to do it and to go on a journey with them, to sit in that uncomfortable space and be very uncomfortable with these stories and let that happen. Just, you know, let that discomfort exist between inside you and between both of you and in them and not be afraid of it. And I think, I think that's, that's where this work is, is really done. That's good. That's, I think that'll, that'll be a good ending. Thank you so much um, for coming on and thank you for, for sharing your journey here and your service and, and your passion for this population and for, for moral injury and how we might better help people through it. So I appreciate that. Well, thanks for having me on and, and thanks for doing this uh, podcast. It, uh, it's become a part of my life and it makes my life better. And so I, <laughs> it does. It's, it hard does. To, it's hard to think that that's the case, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll receive that. I'll keep telling you until you believe it. <laughs> so you can internalize it. It, it, your podcast makes my life better in many different ways and I'm, I'm very appreciative and, and I'm uh, flattered that you have me on thank you so much